um, I'm going to start with when last month I presented about a scientist who was a zoologist and I shared also that my major in college was zoology and it actually stems back to Jane Goodall um, who I read when I was in high school and I read about her and I studied her work at that time and I thought it was very cool that she lived with the chimpanzees and she was a primatologist. Um, she was, you know, groundbreaking. Women were not dominating that field at all. Um, and her discovery that they use tools was groundbreaking. Uh, and then she has an organization now called Roots and Shoots nonprofit to help empower kids it was a very interesting, it was my first year teaching and Jane Goodall came to the University of New Hampshire. And it was my very first field trip that I ever took kids on in my entire teaching career. So it was really neat to go see one of my inspirations, the person that really inspired me to go into the field of science as the first field trip that I took my students on. And it was a really small class that I took and it was really neat just to see her and hear her speak. And I couldn't believe how lucky I was at that moment, listening to Jane Goodall and bringing students with me who I hoped were just as inspired as the work um, that she did as I was at that time. So there's a link there for you. And that is how I'll kick it off. Um, and the next person up to share their slide is, is this you, Larissa? Yep. Um, I'm not sharing my screen. I'm going to use uh, whatever you put on the screen. Thank you very much for your help. So um, I have many wonderful women uh, role models and, uh, and a lot of women around the world who I greatly admire, who still alive and functioning and doing their jobs uh, and those who are not with us anymore but still inspiring us um, as role models in uh, many different fields in in science and engineering so um when i came here to us many many years ago so um i got introduced to uh, uh what many local uh, uh, great role models. And one of them was uh, Rachel Carlson. Um, I purchased books uh, in now, we, we have a place in Falmouth and which is very close to Woods Hole. And uh, that's where we had um, participated with children and many readings devoted to Rachel Carlson. And then I got interested myself and uh, bought many other books and actually looked into her research and data collection and what exactly did she do. So she is inspiring a lot of um, environmental environmentalists, not only in New England, in Massachusetts, but around the world. And I decided that um, I was very, um, I was very happy to, to uh, see um, the sculpture, I, I don't know, I'm missing my uh, word in my vocabulary. It's it's not a sculpture, but what's the word I should use? Uh, but uh, uh, the the special um, um, place in Woods Hole where they put the, um, it's not a monument. What's the, <laughs> I need some help here <laughs> for it's some. A memorial? It, might, it, it is a statue, but perhaps it's a memorial to Rachel Carson. Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's uh, they, they, included it into the um, sort of a very comfortable place where people sit on the bench and it's just, it's not something that uh, uh, perceived as very formal, but it's almost like people can sit with her on the bench. And, and I, I, I think if she would be alive and looked into this, she would love it. So, but again, um, I, I looked uh, more in depth in what kind of data she collected and how she did it. And it's just, if you have time and interested in, in that story from data collection and data analysis perspective, um, this is something that uh, really put me in awe how she did it with a very limited 
tools compared to today's. So she she's really a hero in that regard. Yeah. So and she is an inspiration for a whole environmental movement in in the U.S. I'm I'm sure you know more about this than I do, but I decided to remember her on this very special day. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. And you are the next slide as well, right? Yeah. So um, I was very fortunate to be um, educational outreach consultant on the documentary about Marion Stoddard. And that gave me a unique chance to meet with her, to, to spend time with her and, and the film crew. And it just really was an amazing experience. Uh, so I, I felt very fortunate to have that opportunity spending um, not many days, maybe two or three weeks with, with the film crew and with Marion. Uh, she's a, a also a very famous environmentalist uh, who still lives in Massachusetts and citizen scientist. Um, I didn't know about that uh, before I met with her that it, it's, um, I put two pictures uh, that maybe those who live in New Hampshire, I'm not sure if this, re uh, any recollection. Uh, so from the uh, one side, you see the Nashua River being very polluted and the children uh, who, um, who lived in that area, um, I remember they just said that that's how they, they thought that this is, this is how rivers, they changing different colors and smell bad. This is a natural thing. But uh, in fact, when Marion really put her uh, team together and really push through uh, uh, different channels to clean that water. This is how it looks like. And now um, it, was, uh, um, it, was, uh, it was not even suitable enough to transport uh, the trash uh, when she started, but now it's almost uh, a pure clean water. And it's just an amazing example what one person can do if she or he wants to do it. So in, it's due to her um, efforts, the Federal Water Quality Act and Massachusetts Clean Act uh, was made the cleanup of the Nashua River possible. And just, she put a lot of effort into this and she never stopped. And she actually uh, founded the Nashua River Watershed Association. Uh, and she is very active dis despite her age. And you see her, uh, canoeing and uh, and I don't know maybe uh, Jennifer, uh, you you saw the Nashua River. So I'm very proud that my two cents cont contribution, uh, uh, just being really near that wonderful person and really hearing her uh, wonderful um, thoughts uh, uh, spoken out loud and. It just we made presentations at UMass Boston and in Holy Cross and Smith College. I was just happy to be a person behind the scene who organized it. She she is really a, a role model. If she if you have a chance to read about her, I would encourage you to do so. Thank you. Thank you, Larissa. And next up is Kristen, right? Yep. So um, this is Joanne Simpson. Um, I mean, you can see I put a fair bit of information there just in case I wasn't going to be able to be here. But um, first woman, first American woman to earn a PhD in meteorology. The biography actually noted that there were some, some women, I think some German women who got PhDs in meteorology prior to Joanne Simpson in 1949, but it's an oft repeated error. She was the first American woman, not the first woman. Um, and yeah, so she, she did a lot of really interesting things before she got to Goddard. She worked at a couple of different research facilities and had also, I think, some not very good experiences in academia as a woman trying to be a professor in the, you know, the 50s and early 60s. Um, and also actually was part of some projects with, um, with uh, weather modification even um, and at NOAA and some other things that, you know, just a very diverse background before she got to Goddard. Um, in, uh, I forget what year she started working at Goddard. It was, I think, 80s sometime. Um, but she then shepherded the TRIM, tro Tropical Rainfall Measuring Mission, um, as part of the study team and then, um, and, you know, was around for the launch and all that. And so that was actually able to prove her hot tower hypothesis about um, what powers hurricanes or one of the things that could cause hurricanes to strengthen. So you can see a picture there from early TRIM data of a hot tower in Hurricane Bonnie 
Um, and I'd heard about her before, but I recently, I, someone had suggested this biography um, the, the, the title is down there, First Woman, Joanne Simpson and the Tropical Atmosphere, which I liked because it talked about her, it really gave her a picture of her as a full person who was, you know, had challenges, was also, you know, one of the things the author notes is she kept these detailed logs about her scientific research and also some personal journals um, that, that included a lot about, she had, um, three marriages and a pretty long-term affair with a fourth man. And she talks a lot about them. She doesn't talk about her children much in her, in her journals. Um, although she had three children, I think. Um, so, you know, it was just, it was a very, a picture of a person who was a real person as well as a brilliant scientist and was not perfect. Um, but, you know, I, and, I, and I appreciate that kind of complexity in, in um, showcasing somebody. So that's why I picked her. And there's also a nice long Earth Observatory article about her as well um, that might be more accessible than the uh, the, the um, um, biography, the book. So Joanne Simpson. Thank you, Kristen. And you had put another resource in the chat for people. Uh, no, Dorian did that uh, about STEM careers and Women's History Month and NASA. So I make sure share. I don't have a slide, but I, I have it up. I, I could share my screen and just give a little synopsis if you wanted me to. Yeah, so um, let's go and see who our next slide is and then we can circle back, Dorian. That would be great. So please do share it uh, once we've gotten through. Let's see. Uh, I think this was uh, Christine from Talcott Mountain. Nobody on here is with Talcott Mountain, is that correct? And nobody came in. So I will um, I will say uh, that this one is Dr. Oh, Bridget. Wow. Um, is that, anyone want to take a guess at the last name and pronunciation? Zakhar Kazenko. No, it's uh, Bridget Zaharchenko. Thank you, Larissa. PhD in ecology and evolutionary biology, BS in applied zoology. Oh, right up my field right there. Passionate science teacher and mentor at Talcott Mountain Science Center. Inspires students through hands-on investigation in ecology, AMP, energy, biodiversity, marine science, chemistry, and especially entomology, her personal passion. That is so cool because we have a theme of zoology and also entomology that is continuing from our Black History Month slides. So that's nice. That is great. Um, so it sounds like this is a person that works at Talcott Mountain, and in case uh, anybody was unaware of this, Talcott Mountain is a GLOBE partnership in Connecticut. So it's nice to have representation from that organization. And Todd Toth sent this slide along. I know some of you know Madele and from our GLOBE work, and she is at NASA Langley. And she is definitely an excellent scientist. Uh, she does have, there was a little video of her and her children about clouds. And she's also a great mentor and supporter of the student interns that they have at NASA Langley too. So that's a great share. And this is a slide that Haley put together, and there may be some familiar faces on this slide as well. These are some of the GLOBE teachers that we have been working with for the past couple of years. Um, and Haley adds this note to the GLOBE teachers, having a female science teacher as a role model encouraged me in my science career. And this is only a small selection of the teachers that we work with. So uh, kudos to all of our GLOBE teachers, 
especially the female ones that are really modeling doing science with their students and inspiring the girls in their classrooms. And, you know, it's, I think it's pretty amazing that there are so many of the globe science teachers that we've met who have degrees in science and then felt their calling was in teaching. Um, so I think that that is also a great model for students. Um, and I think actually that might be, that's the end of the slideshow. So I will stop sharing. And Dorian, if you wanted to add anything with cool. your yeah, slide and show us yeah. that. Let's see if this will work. Okay. so um. One of the things that, that I get to do with the hat that I wear that works with the Global Precipitation Measurement Mission is I get to help to create some products to be able to share how the data are being used, you know, for, for various and sundry real world applications. Kind of like Kristen was doing earlier when she was talking about the way in which um, uh, the scientist that she was focusing on was using the data for, you know, hurricanes. So in this case, I interviewed two um, early career female scientists. The first one is um, this woman named Sarah Davidson. And um, she basically works as connective tissue is how I like to say it. She works to make data that's freely available, um, accessible and in a form that animal ecologists who, who study animal movement can, can use the data. So that's, that's uh, some information about her and a little bit of information about um, some of the research that she's done. And then I had the opportunity to also work with another absolutely inspiring um, early career female scientist who also works with data. We kind of call these two data heroes because um, rather than being research scientists themselves, what they're doing is they are data curators and data analysts, um, really fascinating STEM career up opportunities right now. And they work to, you know, get this data that's so complicated sometimes to understand, and there's so much of it. And they make it accessible and meaningful. In uh, Liz's case, she makes it accessible to um, decision makers all over the world through the World Resources Institute. One of the types of resource uh, decision makers she works with are people who work in places where there are landslides, and then I just wanted to show you another thing I created for each of these. Let's see if this will open up. Was I created a story map for each of these um, scientists. And in this story map, what you can do is you go through when you get a little bit further down and it focuses on some STEM career questions. So I ask them questions about what do you enjoy about your career? How did you get into it? What are some of the challenges that you face so far? You know, and that sort of thing. So when you go to that website, you'll find one story map that focuses on the work of Sarah Davidson, and then another um, uh, story map. And this one now focuses on the work that's being done by Liz. And again, when you kind of come down here, or you come over this way, I ask her about her you know, early education, you know, what did she study in college? How did she get into the work that she's doing now? So it was really exciting to, to work on creating this and to work with these two absolutely incredible um, early career scientists who are basically, you know, that, that connective tissue working with that data. And then there was a video that our video producer put together where he um, basically worked with um, the, the woman, Sarah Davidson, who is with the um, Move Bank. And he um, created a, a video that focuses on how NASA data is used to support animal ecologists. One other thing I'll throw in there is that when you go to the story map, at the end of it, I have a short STEM interview that was done, which is a video with each of those two different um, female scientists. So very inspirational. They are, you know, early career scientists who are in the field right now, and they do a super good job, I think, of explaining what got them there. You know, one of them when she was in high school, there was no um, no club for the environment. So she started one 
And then that led to um, doing a lot of work with um, the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. And that led to an internship. And then that led to, you know, going to college. So really, really neat way to show how they, these two women never started off thinking they were going to specialize in math and become, you know, data curators and data analysts, but that's where they ended up. So I, I hope these are useful. And if you, you know, please share them. And if you um, have any suggestions for ways I could make them more accessible, just feel free to reach out and let me know. And uh, I, uh, your, your, uh, your feedback and guidance is always very much appreciated. Sorry about the dog in the backyard. It's not mine. <laughs> Thank you, Dorian. Um, let's see, Christy, did you want to share your rap song? So there's a rap song. Um, I, so anyways, when I was in middle school, I learned all about Madame Curie, Marie Curie, and she was born in Warsaw. And um, my mother's side is from Poland. And so, uh, you know, I grew up learning about Marie Curie and um, being a chemist and radio nuclear physicist, really. Um, and learning, I remember learning about how um, she was the youngest of five and I was the youngest of five. Like, I was like, I want to be her, but not die of bone cancer from radiation that that you know she uh, got from her amazing work so when I used to teach middle and high school science a lot of my students loved uh, I, learning from music and from rap and um, so I went to teachers pay teachers and found a rap song that I can share with everyone that does a better job than I would and it would be kind of fun. So if we, the long version's three minutes. Do we have three minutes for a Marie, Marie Curie rap song, Jen? Jen says, okay. So let me share with the sound and optimum. Okay, there we go. So this is by, um, oh, now I have to, you can't see me signing in to you, my password. I have a new computer that makes ever. So you see my screen now, and this is from Teachers Pay Teachers, and um, this is rap opera for kids, which has these biographies and then makes songs about them. And I went ahead and got this. And I will make it large here. Born in Warsaw, Poland, Maria Sklodowska, 1867, the 7th of November. Back then, Poland was divided, oppression Russian owned. No time for science, no Polish language, not even songs. Pops taught us science when no one was looking. How to think, how to learn, how to ask the right questions. Sad times hit, mom's heart quit before she hit 13. Poor life with dad, mom gone, but Maria Here overcame. Point with science, yeah, cause the aim is on. discoveries in the field, lacking the Amazon. For setting in the biz, like it's that Amazon. She amazed many girls, get you amazed. In 1882, she graduated from high school, but higher study took hiatus, held back by man's views. Graduated at the top of a class called medals and all, but women were still imprisoned within the gender wall. People told Maria man search, but she would rather research. Expected to marry, but was in love with the science work. Spent five years saving up her money as a tutor to finance her education in a place that would accept her. 1891, France, him. Maria comes, name changed to Marie to blend with the city of Sauvon. We've got it all figured out, she was told by the science faction. But Marie remained curious, undeterred by their reaction. University life in the 1890s for a poor Polish woman was as easy as juggling fire into the ocean. Still, in Marie's first year, she was the number one student in her class. She had no money, but found a job using her skills as a scientist. Curious on point with science, yeah, cause the aim is on. Made discoveries in the field, lacking the Amazon. Trend setting in the biz, like it's that Amazon. She amazed me. Many girls get you amazed on how you resolve point with science. Yeah, cause the Amazon made discoveries in the field, lacking the Amazon. Trend setting in the biz, like it's that Amazon. She amazed many girls get you amazed on. Working in the lab, Marie met Pierre. In love with the work and each other, a powerful pair. Attracted like magnets, but too soon married. 1896, Mrs. Curie made a discovery, something so astounding, Pierre put his own research aside. Unidentified rays were found that could pass right through a solid, the finding was so solid, Pierre supported his wife. 
Together they discover polonium and radium New elements found man a Nobel Peace Prize foam But only Pierre was nominated for the prize Pierre knew this wasn't fair and made it right for his wife He told the prize committee to add Curie in So in 1903 she became the first woman to win In 1911 Curie made history again This time with an accomplishment never achieved by woman or man Marie won a second Nobel Peace Prize Call it the sequel she leveled up through the math They can't deny that she's equal or even more than equal because, you know, her versus them equals her being great. Anyway, um, 1934, she passed away and the world said goodbye but to an amazing Maria voice. Body, choice lady rocking it through history but speakers. Maria she overcame. hacked into the system, man, they can't delete her. Maria Sinking overcame. into the work, she's a cannon with dead aim. Here we can making waves, a tsunami flooding the plains. Opposition looking sideways, Curie lights them up like Maria x-rays. Overcame. Ruling the glass, she sets them straight like hallways. A name on the rise, look more Curie. A super yeah. woman high flying and signs, check her trajectory. Maria Maria overcame. Bad animal, rap off for kids, y'all already know what it is. <laughs> Click that like button, hit subscribe. Happy Women's History Month, y'all. Girl power. See you next time. This is great. And her daughter also won a Nobel Prize. So I think, as to my knowledge, that's the only um, parent-child um, Nobel Prize winners that I that that I know of. And then, and Madame Curie won two, also. And so I think she was one of the one only women to win two. What struck me, and I love that you know this is for na uh, Women's Nash uh, Women's History Month, right? Did I say that right? And um, and and the. The rap really calls to attention to that. But what struck me when I was in middle school learning about this is the advocacy that her husband did to advocate for her. And I remember my dad um, having lots of conversations with my dad because I was really into science and and uh, was a tomboy. And he, you know, my mom would be like, why don't you wear these more girly clothes? And then I remember this conversation with him about Madame Curie and about how he needed to advocate for me, <laughs> just like his Madame Curie's Pierre advocated for her, you know, his wife to be really who she was meant to be. And like, somehow I was able to bring her into my little struggle of not having to wear dresses. <laughs> Great story, Christy. And um, I didn't know you are uh, you are you are originally your family is originally the roots are from from that area. The real pronunciation uh, would be Varshava, and uh, yeah, and, and it's very interesting because at that time, uh, at her time, Marie Curie, uh, it was part of Russia. So mm -hmm. in the story uh, of her life was included into our physics textbook. So. Um, yeah, it's it's just very interesting. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Fantastic. Yes, thank you. And I put the link for the other educational rap songs, rap opera for kids, in there. There's some great ones. I just scrolled really quickly through the list, so there's some really good ones in there. I'm excited to um, share that. A lot of people have been asking for the resources from this water cooler and from our last one for Black History Month. So I just wanted to make sure that we had some of these resources that we could then share once we um, share the PowerPoint. Um, there is a link to, to the scientist cards uh, in here. And I don't know if anybody's seen those, but the USDA Forest Service has these. And they are really great. They are by different regions of the country that you can look up. So you can look up where the scientists are from. And then they often answer some of those questions about how they got started and things like that. And you can order these for free and uh, for students and teachers. And they're a really, again, a great resource for students. Does anybody else want to give a shout out? Uh, Kristen just put another resource in there about womenshistory.org. But yeah, anybody about it's um it's NASA the Women of NASA um it's a couple years old but it's from the National Women's History Museum and I thought it was a really nicely nicely set up um kind of virtual exhibit thing. 
Great, thank you. Kimberly, you've turned on your camera. Did you want to shout out some female scientists? Yeah, I had one, um, Dr. Gladys West. She is an African-American that's responsible for doing a lot of the mathematics for, G for GPS. So she was the one that did the mathematics realizing that the earth was a geoid shape. So she did a lot of the hand calculations and became one of the programmers for um, that led to the technology for GPS. And we know we use a lot of that flow. So she's another hidden figure. This is great, yes, Kimberly. Is. Do, do you have, sorry, do you have a link by any chance? Um, no, I don't, but I did do a slide, but I did never sent it to Jen. That's okay, but thank you again for sharing. This is great. Okay. You can send me the slide and I'll add it in so that okay. people can still have access to the slide. That would be great. Okay, uh, I'll do it. Thank you, Kimberly. Svetlana, you turned on your camera. I did. Um, I was just in the middle um, uh, of, uh, I had just been reviewing a PowerPoint presentation from my other life, right, which is how students learn by interacting with professionals and so forth. And it happened that I came across a slide that I thought you might be interested in and I can send it. Let me just share it real quick and you guys can let me know. I won't bother to send it if it's not of interest, but this is generic. It's not about women exclusively, but it's a whole thing from one of the county offices here in California that gives guidelines on how to prepare students for a speaker, any kind of speaker. So this applies to women, it applies to scientists of color, whatever. It's just any kind of SME that might come into a classroom. Um, and we've got other materials as well, but this is one that I just happened to be uh, looking at just before the meeting. So. If, um, if this is a value, I can um, send it to Jen to send out to people. It's just, it's just how to make whatever presentation you're doing with any SME, woman or other, uh, more, um, more impactful. Great, we can definitely add this as a resource. I think that having these resources available and shared within our community is wonderful. Um, the Another, Barbara put in that link to the If Then Ambassador Program, and I had been looking at that a lot. There are some excellent resources and just great stories in that. And so if anybody takes a look at that, that's another one to share. Um, we are coming up at the top of the hour. So any last shout outs? And I'm gonna, let's see, John, Jacqueline, Deborah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I do got one, uh, but I would have to share the screen if that's okay. Yes, please do. Okie dokie. So let me go ahead and let me get this prepped up really quick. And then Jacqueline, as soon as he's done, I definitely wanna hear from you as well. Okay. Alrighty, so let's see. I want to get the slide ready here. Alrighty, here we go. So basically what I kind of wanted to show was this slide and I, unfortunately I wasn't able to get it done in time, but it was one that I thought was very interesting. I thought it was very uh, I thought it was important because I, this is something that I did with um, my classes we, during the perseverance landing. Let me turn my camera on here. Hello, hello. So during the camera, during the time that we actually had the perseverance landing, we had it everything live. And one of the things that we did talk about, and I had people from different parts of the El Paso Community College campuses kind of tune in, uh, watching this online. We actually highlighted Diana Trujillo, and she was um, one person. I think a lot of people were able to connect with, especially down here in the El Paso area. I mean her being Hispanic coming from Colombia, there was a there was a relationship that I think a lot of people could actually, you know, appreciate. And I think one of the one of the biggest inspirations when I got to listen to her, especially many of the interviews from CNN Espanol and, and a bunch of other places uh, from different various interviews is that her, her, I wouldn't say rags to riches in a sense, but it was a very, very much like that. I mean, she came from Colombia, again, the traditional idea of like, you know, you know, traditional woman only does certain things. It kind of reminds me of also like what my mom and my grandmother had to do, but then my mom and my grandmother kind of, in a sense, broke barriers, but it was kind of 
for them, I just look at them even from, from as them being my role models, uh, as that was what you need to do. And that's the strength of what they, what they gave to the family, especially my grandmother who ended up becoming a nurse and my mom being a manager at the, uh, at Southwestern Bell. So, I mean, I looked at this and I said, Diana Trujillo came from humble beginnings from Colombia, got here to the United States when she was 18 years old, uh, decided to work her way through literally just a few hundred dollars in her pocket to kind of get going. And then literally she went from community college going into the university, I think there in Florida. And then all of a sudden, boom, she's a season engineer, not exactly that quickly, but I mean, she was able to facilitate so many things along her life and being able to basically realize a lot of her dreams. And as you can see in this picture right here, well, let me see if I can actually move this little guy over here up to the side. So you get to see her. And I think it was really Im impressive for, for, my, for myself, for my, for my mom also looking at this where we I was doing some background research on her. And a lot of the students who were what, you know, saw some of the videos that she, that, um, <clears throat> that were associated with some of her interviews and whatnot. Again, she's right now as an engineering work. She had worked on the Curiosity rover on Mars and also worked is working on the Perseverance mission right now. And her contributions to NASA from is, is long. You know, she has been a very, an inspirational um, person that we can all look up to from men and women alike. I mean, this is something that she was able to do. She showed that, you know, again, within the Hispanic community that yes, you can do this. And, and it was very, it was very touching. It was very moving. And I thought it was very, I think, eye opening for a lot of people saying, yes, I can do that now. And, and, and she was that beacon of, of inspiration. I think a lot of students were able to connect with, and I just choose, I chose Diana Trujillo and, and her accomplishments from family to Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So you have a whole range of what she's done. And um, so that's the, one of the things I think was really highlighted in, in that uh, presentation. Also in the background over here, you get to see from Columbia to Mars is a video I won't play because you know we're, we're kind of short on time, but I mean, the, I'll send you the link or I'll send you the slide, uh, Jennifer, that has the link associated with it in, in uh, just a second. But yeah, the, so she is definitely one of the one of the people I think that that we would highlight and continue to highlight, especially this year, to show that yes, you can do it. Yes, you were able to do it. Yes, you can achieve those dreams. And it's you know we can all come together and and unite. It's more of a uniting factor for us as well. So that's that's my my two cents right there. Thank you, John. And I think what I really like is you mentioned the community college connection as well. Yes. And I, I don't think we talk about that enough, um, that that is definitely a pathway to where, where she is, right? And right. I, I just don't think a lot of times we assume that students will go the four-year route and they don't see that community college is a pathway still to where right. you can become an engineer at NASA, right? And right. Right. I, I really <laughs> think we have to make that story more obvious to students. Um, I love that connection. So thank you too for bringing that up as well. No problem. Um, Jacqueline, you yes. have put something in there, but yeah, go ahead. I yeah, Melba Roy Morton, Mountain. <laughs> Hope I'm saying her name right, but uh, she's another Howard grad. Yay, Howard grads. <clears throat> we have some other people pretty famous that are Howard grads also, and uh, we won't name those people. Um, but she was a head mathematician for Echo Satellites 1 and 2. So she was part of the um, part of NASA when they were going to the moon. So, you know, we've all seen hidden figures. And so it's interesting to see how many women, African-American women were involved with that. And to think that uh, she had a master's degree in mathematics, that to me is amazing because I can hardly put one and two together. So, I mean, just to be able to do that is just amazing. And, um, you know, she graduated from Howard back in 1950 with a master's degree. So, you know, HBCUs are now the thing now, but HBCUs have been putting out some pretty powerful people for a long time. I completely agree. And it is so nice when we finally start hearing about all of these people that we have not been hearing about for so long. And, you know, for, I, I know that as women, 
And a lot of men know that there are amazing women out there, right? Um, but it's just stunning how many we didn't know about. <laughs> And now that we know that this happened, it's <laughs> like, oh my goodness, how many more other people don't we know about? <laughs> There's hidden figures everywhere. Um, so, and I love telling the stories and I love hearing from all of you and your personal connections to the stories. I think that makes them more relevant. And if we can keep doing that with students and for students, just, you know, finding the hidden figures, right? finding the people that haven't been talked about for one reason or another and making those stories more obvious and making sure we make those connections for students. 